Hi everyone, my name is Raymond. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Minnesota. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, gravitational waves and dark tunnel dark matter from axon rotations. But before I get into in, before I get into physics, I would just like to mention that I would like to dedicate this talk to Arnold Penzias, who was born today uh, 78 years ago and went on to win the Nobel Prize in physics in 1978 for the discovery of the CMB radiation. So to honor him, I'm gonna talk about gravitational radiation in this talk. So the storyline of the talk, I will first talk about uh, axon dynamics in the early universe and how it could be motivated from theoretical consideration and why that's interesting in general. In the second half of the talk, then I will focus on the production of gravitational waves and dark photon dark matter from this uh, new axon dynamics. So in this talk, even though I call it the axons, uh, in the concrete model that we consider, we're thinking about particle, but there's no particular reason why this mechanism would not work for the QCD axion. So let me just define my potential and the field carefully. So what I'm thinking about is a complex field that has two degrees of freedom. The radial direction is what we call uh, the saxion. We're borrowing the language from supersymmetry, even though we don't always have to have uh, supersymmetry. So in this case, uh, the radial direction is the saxion. That's the one that gets the vacuum expectation volume. And that's the decay constant of the axion. The angular direction is the uh, axion. The complex field is what we call P. As you can see, S is the radial direction and phi is the axion direction. All right, so let me talk about the axon rotation. So what has been considered in the literature is that it is possible that the saxion can be sitting at the origin or the minimum or at a large field value initially. Afterwards, then it goes through radio oscillations when the Hubble is comparable to the saxon mass. What we're considering in this talk and many other uh, papers is that it is possible that not only is the saxon sitting at a large field volume, but there's some uh, potential terms for the axial will actually give a gradient in the angular direction, which means that if you just imagine dropping a ball at this wiggle point of the uh, complex field potential, it's not expected that this ball will actually oscillate radially. Instead, it will actually have some kind of spiral motion. So this is the uh, idea of the initial condition. But let me be more mathematical. Let me just say that uh, I have to uh, motivate two things for you. First, I want to motivate why uh, we start with a large field volume where the uh, explicit symmetry breaking will be present. Then I will talk about why there should be explicit uh, symmetry breaking. So first, you can just uh, imagine that during inflation, the saxon has to start somewhere in the potential. And there's actually no reason for the saxon to be at the origin or at the minimum of the uh, wine bottle potential, especially if the saxon is light. By light, I mean smaller than the Hubble scale during inflation. So let's take the assumption that the saxon mass is light so that during inflation, it doesn't get relaxed to the minimum of the potential. In that case, then you can understand the initial field value of the saxion as just an initial condition. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that this saxion may couple to the inflaton. In that case, then the saxion can obtain a potential with a Hubble-induced mass. So this mass term is given by the Hubble scale during inflation. And this mass term can be positive or negative. If it is negative, then what it means is that the mass term for the saxion is tachyonic. So it will be driven to a very large field volume, which is further stabilized by the higher dimensional operator. So as you can see from this potential, then the balance between this tachyonic mass and the higher uh, dimension operator tells you that the saxion initial field value during inflation can be driven to, uh, very close, to a volume very close to the cutoff scale of the theory, if d is uh, not too small. In that case, then the saxon can be dynamically set to a large field volume without any uh, tuning or initial condition. Then the next thing I want to explain is that after we have this uh, large field volume, how do we know it should be doing an oscillation in the radial direction or an angular motion? In a spiral motion. Case, uh, what we call explicit break, uh, peak breaking is just all the potential terms that would give rise to the mass in the axon direction. It is expected 
because a conjecture in quantum gravity says that the global UN symmetry is not expanded in uh, or it's not respected in quantum gravity. In that case, then you can think of the PQ symmetry as arising as an accidental symmetry. In other words, we expect to have higher dimensional operators suppressed by the cutoff scale of the theory. Even if it is raised to power, it is still expected to be present. Normally, this is uh, considered in the context of quality problem in the sense that we don't want this explicit peak breaking term to give an axon mass to the QCD axion that is larger than contribution from the uh, QCD effect. So normally there's some model building that you need to consider to make this higher dimension operator high enough. For example, n could be 10 or 12 to make sure that the axon quality is not a problem. But in this case, we're saying that even when this power is high, Normally, you would think that this is the decay constant Fa over the cutoff scale to a very high power. So this is completely negligible. But that's only true if the saxion is already at the minimum of the potential. In the early universe, it is possible that the saxion is starting with a very large field value, as we have just argued. In fact, it can be actually order one away from the cutoff scale of the theory, which means that this order one number raised to a large power may not be completely negligible. And that's the basis of the dynamics that we're considering. So I'm not going to talk in uh, talk about in detail all the um, numbers that go into this initiation, but we have looked quite carefully and found that um, even if we have a high power, this has a sizable effect in terms of driving the angular motion in the axon direction. And I should say that this whole uh, picture, except the minimum of the potential, is motivated by afflect ambergenesis. In their case, um, they're not thinking about a complex uh, scalar field that breaks the PQ symmetry. Instead, they're thinking about the scalar partner of the leptons or quarks, which would be the leptons and quarks that are doing the rotation. And those field rotations would carry lepton number or baryon number, and they can uh, perform analysis on those to get baryogenesis story to work out. So in our talk, we would also have a, a quantum number. So let me just explain how you think about the rotation in the context of conserved quantity. So as we know, the Neuter theorem says that if you have a conserved, uh, if you have a symmetry in the problem, then you conserve charge. In this case, if you think about it classically, then we have the rotational symmetry. Then the uh, conserved quantity associated with the rotational symmetry is the angular momentum. And let's see if this uh, carries out in the language of field theory. So here we have a shift symmetry. The way you compute the noise charge would be this quantity, P against the complex field. And if I write it in this uh, parameterization, then you see that the end result is S squared theta dot. And this is, is exactly what we expected because S is the radius in this field uh, space. Theta dot is the angular speed, which is omega. So this is R square omega, and this is nothing but angular momentum. So my point here is that even though we have some PQ breaking in the early, uh, early universe, but soon after the onset of oscillation, then this quantity becomes a conserved one. Because as you can see, uh, those wiggles, the explicit PQ breaking would only be effective if you are at a large field value. As the redshift depletes the um, amplitude of the motion, then very quickly, this becomes a uh, conserved quantity. So sometimes I'm going to call this rotation the PQ asymmetry, or the PQ charge density, or the PQ charge asymmetry. All of those mean the same thing, and there is the rotation of the PQ field. And it is given by this quantity. So the PQ charge is conserved soon after the onset of the motion. All right, and now I'm going to argue why, in our case, or in the case of uh, Affleck line, there is actually uh, expected to have a large angular speed. So first, the idea is that this quantity is a uh, co-moving, uh, this quantity is a number density. So if you look at the total charge, MPQ times the scale factor cubed, then this should be the total charge and that should be a conserved quantity. So the convention, in the conventional case, if I just assume the saxon already at the minimum in the early universe, then as you can see from this scaling, then theta dot itself, has to scale as r to the minus three because s is constant. But in our scenario, if s 
is much larger than the vacuum volume, then this S square can actually scale as R to the minus Q for the quartic potential in the Saxon direction, or it can scale as um, R to the minus three in the quartic potential in the Saxon direction. In those cases, from this scaling, then you can work theta scale, theta dot scales as R to the minus one, or theta dot actually remains a constant. And this is actually uh, understood in the context of Affleck line baryogenesis. But the end point here is that comparing the um, scaling in the conventional scenario with what we're thinking about, you can see that the redshift of theta dot is um, much slower than expected. In, in that sense, then if you initiate some angular speed at high temperature, it is more likely that you actually preserve this high speed to low temperatures when you think about uh, different things, for example, virgences, dark matter production, or in this case, we're thinking about uh, production of gravitational wave. All right, so this slide is for people who think a lot about cosmological evolution with the scalar fields and thermization. So the idea is that after you um, initiate the motion, it is in principle uh, an elliptical motion. The reason is that you not only drive the field in the angular direction, but you also have the Saxon mass that drives it in the radial direction. In that sense, then you, you have to have a um, non-perfect motion, non-perfectly circular motion. In this case, that would be the uh, elliptical motion. And the idea is that if you have some interaction between this PQ field and the standard model bath, then it is possible that we thermalize the energy from this field. But what is important is shown in this video that you don't actually thermalize the entire energy density. The idea looks at this, that if you have thermalization, instead of thermalizing the whole field energy density down to the minimum of the potential, what you thermalize is actually the radial oscillation. The reason is that we have a conserved quantity, the PQ charge asymmetry, uh, if we introduce couplings that are PQ symmetry uh, respecting, then what it means is that this thermalization cannot remove the charge density. The most it can remove is the uh, energy density that's not associated with the PQ charge, meaning the energy density that's not associated with rotation, which is the radial oscillation. So you transform this elliptical motion into a circular motion at thermalization. Then at this point, the motion becomes almost uh, perfectly circular. Then as the universe expands, the radius of this uh, circular motion shrinks until you reach the minimum of the potential. So this is the story for the thermalization. This is what allows us to assume that the motion is actually perfectly circular uh, in the following part of my talk. So we assume thermalization occurs and we check that exactly that it can occur before the relevant temperatures that we're going to discuss in what follows. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the implication for this uh, kind of rotation, especially if we think about the uh, coupling between the axon and dark photon coupling. So first, we have this uh, coupling between the axion and the dark photon uh, written here. And this alpha D is the fine structure for the dark gauge boson. What we can understand is that what happens if we have a coupling between the axon and the dark photon? One possibility is that this dark photon would actually have an equator motion that's modified by the axion. So this is the additional term that is uh, pressed in the dark photon uh, equator motion because of the presence of this coupling. And again, this theta dot is the field T divided by F the decay constant. If you look at this uh, equator motion carefully, you will see that this whole thing is not always positive. Uh, conventionally, you have a dark photon mass square, the momentum square, and then now you're adding this uh, extra term that gives you an oscillation or some deviation from the positive term. So two possibilities, the axion, Talk, uh, it is possible that we have some axon uh, oscillation. In the conventional case, then this axon oscillation would just be described by cosine function with some red shifting factor. Then this theta dot would be an oscillatory um, function. But for rotation, 
as you have seen before, that rotation is actually a constant. So this theta dog can redshift or it, it can actually stay as a constant. If it stays a constant, then this means that uh, theta dot is actually always a positive number or a negative number. It doesn't alternate in sign. Even if theta dot redshifts, this theta function still stays the same sign throughout the evolution. What it means is that there's some qualitative difference between the oscillation case and rotation case in terms of what we're going to consider uh, below. And what is called Tachyon stability is the idea that if this quantity, if I call it the effective mass, if this effective mass is negative, then as you can see, this is just a, a second order differential equation with a negative coefficient, then the solution of it is an exponential. In that case, then the solution is an exponential growth. And that's why I call the Tachyon instability. Tachyon means that the mass is, the effective mass term is negative. The stability tells you that the solution is exponentially grown, which means that we're actually very efficiently transferring the energy density from the axion to the dark photon. And this was first considered in the context of preheating. If you think of the axion as um, uh, uh, inflaton field, and if this is the photon, then it is possible that you're uh, efficiently producing photons. Uh, but there's also some complications about how you should think about the thermal effects of the photons. But in this case, I'm thinking about dark photons, and I'm assuming that there's no dark charged particle to avoid uh, those technical points. And what is important in this slide is that we have a tachyonic growth, but the mode that grows most efficiently is when this effective mass is the most negative. And if you just solve this one quickly, and if you just set the dark photon mass to be com uh, completely negligible compared to the scales that we're thinking about, then the uh, mode that we're growing is given by theta dot times some uh, alpha, alpha factor. And this video will show you uh, some understanding of the oscillation for the tachyonic stability and the case for the rotation. As we have seen before, the effective mass, which is the curvature of the potential of the dark photon, is determined by the axon field volume or the axon velocity. In the oscillation case, the sign of the theta dot alternates. So the potential actually alternates up and down. But as you can see, when it is downward, then the solution is exponential. And that's exactly the reason why we were efficiently transferring the axon energy density into the dark photon one. But in the case of rotation, theta dot does not oscillate. Theta dot stays in the same sign. In that case, then the solution is just exponential. It doesn't even alternate back to the positive term. And this will go on until back reactions become, and that back reaction will stop the transfer of the axon field, uh, axon energy density into the dark photon. To understand the entire um, spectrum the efficiency of transfer, we need to have a lattice simulation, which is also the scope of our paper. So what we do is that we just assume the following, that the energy density of the axion is transferred in order one fraction to the dark photon. And we assume that back reaction becomes important at that stage. In that case, then we have the uh, order one left over in the axon field energy density and order one amount in the dark photon. But there is a very important difference between the oscillation case and the rotation case. In the oscillation case, at the time of onset of the axon uh, uh, oscillation, Hubble scale should be comparable to the axon mass and Hubble scale redshifts. And the production rate, as we have seen before, looks at alpha d over four pi times theta dot, but this theta dot, the speed of the axon field velocity is again by the axon mass. Then if you compare these two terms, if you want this production rate to be as large as Hubble, then you actually need this alpha d to be very large, meaning of order four. And Hubble scales faster, it drops faster than the rate, which means that you really need this alpha d to be close to four pi in order to have sufficient uh, production rate to efficiently produce the dark photon. But in the case of rotation, this is not the case. Um, at the onset of uh, the motion, the can be of order theta dot or even higher. The point is that the production rate is given by theta dot. And in some cases, this theta dot is actually a constant. 
So this process is actually IR dominated. So as, uh, the longer you wait, the more efficient this rate becomes. So even if you start with a very small or very large Hubble rate, the only thing you have to do is to wait and uh, wait for long enough so that Hubble drops below the rate and then efficient production occurs. In that case, then we allow alpha D to be very small. All right, so now it's to get application for gravitational waves. So here H is the perturbation to the metric. And the second equation is the equation motion for the metric. And this pi factor is the transverse traceless and isotropic uh, stress tensor. The idea is that now you're pr producing a bunch of dark photons with a very uh, high contrast in the uh, momentum in the sense that what we're producing is a um, very sharply picked momentum spectrum because we're producing it with technical stability and there's a momentum mode that's most efficiently produced, exponentially more efficient. In that case, then you can imagine that you're creating a large fluctuations in the space time because of the energy density of the dark photon. Then in that case, then we can uh, estimate the gravitational wave produced from the dark photon energy density. And if I normalize it to the energy density at the time of production, it is given by this formula. So it is proportional to the dark photon uh, energy density square. And this RP is the order one factor that tells you how efficient you're producing it or um, it marks the end of the production where the production becomes important. And this is again fixed by lattice simulation. But in our case, we just assume it to be of order 10. So let me first uh, point out that this idea of producing gravitational wave from maximum velocity and producing the dark photon uh, energy density was first proposed by this group. And the idea was uh, considered in this plot. And this is the case of oscillation. So it is possible that you have different uh, axon masses. And if the axons start oscillating at different temperatures, assuming large enough uh, initial um, field value of the axion, and also assuming alpha to be very close to uh, 4 pi or even actually past 4 pi, then you can produce uh, these additional wave signals. And this is the idea for oscillations. What is interesting is that uh, there's a tentative signal, in the nanograph experiment that is pointing to a region around here. And it can be explained by this axon oscillation with tachyonic stability, except that you actually overproduce uh, axon dark matter, meaning that you need to have large enough initial field value of the axion to have enough energy density to do that. And you have to either um, make the axon mass somewhat smaller at low temperature so that it doesn't close, overclose the universe, or you just have to use a mechanism to produce gravitational wave in this uh, large strength. But that's not the case if we're thinking about rotation. And in fact, we have to look at um, a specific model that we're not going into detail. That model is some uh, uh, vector-like fermions that couple to the saxion to make sure that the axions are stabilized properly. And then we just pick a few benchmark points in this parameter space, and we find that we actually have wide open parameter space without overproducing the axon dark matter. The main reason is that in our scenario, we don't actually require the uh, axon to be mapped. As we have seen before, this theta dot is not coming from the mass of the axon as before. It's coming from whatever peak that we have in the early universe. And that means in the middle of the, um, in the minimum of the one potential, we can actually have a completely flat potential. The axon is completely massless. And we don't have to assume a dark photon mass. So the dark photon can be massless. In that case, then we don't actually have any uh, matter component left over after taking this ability. So this is the reason why we don't actually have any uh, axon dark matter or uh, dark photon dark matter overproduction issue. So that's the idea for gravitational wave production. But we can ask the question of how uh, can we actually make the dark photon, the dark matter candidate in our scenario? Then what we have to look at is that um, First, let's understand the limitation for the conventional case, the oscillations. The idea is that 
you cannot, for the oscillation case, you have to make sure that the dark photon mass is less than the axon mass. Otherwise, tectonic stability would not occur. The mass term will actually dominate over, the positive mass term will dominate over the negative tectonic term from the axon oscillation. In that case, and also you need to make sure that the axon itself is somehow thermalized. Otherwise, the axon will become the dark matter candidate. In that case, then you're limited to a large enough uh, dark photon mass, given, for example, in our paper uh, about three years ago, we consider a specific realization and the dark photon mass has to be larger than, let's say, 10 to minus seven EV. And that's not the case for rotation. The reason is that the axion can be massless. So we don't actually have any uh, problem of having axion uh, radiation or even axion uh, connection after it becomes the rotation at the minimum of the potential and then it completely redshifts away. So instead, we can actually just fully consider uh, the dark form of dark matter without any worry of the axon overproduction. So what I'm going to show you is the correlation between the gravitational wave signals and the properties of the dark photon. First, we recall that the strength of the gravitational wave is related to the energy density of the dark photon at the time of production. And the second point we need to make is that when the Hubble rate is at the production time, we have the momentum of the dark photon, which would now become the momentum of the gravitational wave at that time. And this momentum of the gravitational wave will eventually redshift to give you the frequency of the gravitational wave signal, the peak frequency. And here, after the redshift, this momentum at production would redshift also to give you the momentum of the dark photon uh, today. So that means there is some correlation not only in the energy density of the two species, but also in the frequency and the momentum. So if you just do the um, uh, calculation more precisely, then you will find that it is possible that uh, when the gravitational wave strength is too large, then you actually would require to have a momentum of the dark photon that is too hot to be dark matter. But this conclusion is actually only tentative because it is possible that there is some uh, part, uh, particle cascade to the IR in the sense that when the dark photons are produced, they actually scatter and cool themselves down to an Einstein condensate. But we're not able to conc uh, concretely um, argue that, that this must be the case. So this has to be further confirmed by lattice simulation. But what we're saying is that naively you would expect uh, dark photon dark matter to be too warm above the solid red line, but it is uh, very likely that it is um, much relaxed compared to this red line. But let's leave with this red line for now. Then what we see is that, for example, if we pick a point in this prominent space and see if we are able to produce both dark matter uh, from dark photon and gravitational wave signal using the model that we have considered, then it turns out that we do have uh, open problem this space as well. So our conclusion here is that we're able to produce dark photon dark matter for actually uh, very light dark photons, as you see in those contours, and where you have um, observable gravitational signals. And in this talk, uh, I'm not focusing on this uh, story, but I just want to mention that the rotation of the axon is very well motivated in other contexts. For example, the axon by itself, axon dark matter, or we could also have baryon asymmetry from the axon rotation for the QCD axon or axon-like particle or the QCD axon with some lepton number violating process. And here comes the conclusion. So I hope I convinced you that the new axon dynamics would be very interesting to consider as a way to produce dark photon dark matter that could actually be warm and also gravitational wave signals could be originating from the axon mix. And not discussing this talk, I also mentioned that the, ax uh, the new axon dynamics could actually allow the QCD axon to solve multiple mysteries of the universe. Thank you.